Hi there. My name is Garrett Elford, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as pastor at Good New Trinity Lutheran Church. I'm glad that you are able to gather with us in this way. We are going to sing praises to Jesus and focus on his amazing work for us. We are continuing a message series that we've been in for several weeks now called The Mission, where we are looking at the final moment in Matthew's gospel when Jesus told his disciples what their big mission was now that he had done all of his big work on earth. The Lord be with you as we worship him together. And please fill out the form for the online connection card that is in the description for this video. Thank you for doing that. Let's begin with our first song. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. Because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. In the house of his servant David. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. And thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you. And his glory appears over you. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Were we to praise God outwardly? yet inwardly have prideful and arrogant hearts. We would be depriving ourselves of the deep help that God gives. And we would be depriving others of receiving God's blessings through us. God created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us turn back to God, whose mercy we need. Merciful Father in heaven, I have been sinning even from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life, 
and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our next song. Father, you who sit enthroned above all the world, please bless us with your many gifts, including the gift of purpose and mission, and give us strength and humility to listen to you and to follow in your ways. For you live with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Let's sing our next song.
Our next reading comes from the New Testament, one of the Gospels, the Gospel of John, chapter 10. This is known as the Good Shepherd chapter, and here we are listening to words from Jesus about his mission and the scope of his mission. John chapter 10. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let's sing our next song.
prayer and hope is that you will be able to rest in God's grace and mercy through our time together in his word. We are headed right back into the passage that has been our focus for the past month. This final scene in Matthew's gospel, it's only one paragraph long, and we're just over halfway through it. And as I read for you what we've looked at so far, I want you to try to picture it in your mind. Here we go. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Hopefully you were able to picture at least some of those details in your mind. Uh, Eleven guys walking up a mountain, far away from any big cities. Out there is just their small group and seeing Jesus. And they had some interesting reactions. At least some of them worshiping Jesus, some with doubt in their hearts. And then Jesus came closer, and clearing his throat, he declared the authority that had been given to him by God the Father. And then Jesus said plainly what the disciples' mission was, to go and make disciples, make more disciples. Get people to listen. Get people to follow Jesus. You got the picture in your mind? Great. Now we're going to add just a few more words. Jesus said... Go and make disciples of all nations. Of all nations. That's just three extra words. And if you're still trying to picture this and you're looking for more details, that's not really a new detail to how this looked. It's more words, but it doesn't really paint a more detailed picture for us. However, imagine that right at this very moment, When Jesus said to make disciples of all nations, imagine that right then, the disciples looked at each other. Or imagine that they kept their eyes locked on Jesus. Either way, what were they seeing? Not all nations. They were seeing a specific group of people, all of the same ethnicity, all having grown up in the same region, probably having the same skin tone, maybe some common facial features, they were Galileans. So they shared a Galilean heritage. They had some shared Galilean experiences. They shared a Galilean accent. They were used to a Galilean way of life. So as you try and picture in your mind this moment on the mountain, what kinds of people do you see? Do you picture people who look like you? You get that these were first century Jews, right? Like from way, way, way to the east of us. Imagine that we used a computer program to map out the average skin tone of the people of this church. Don't you think it'd be a whole lot whiter than what we'd see on that mountain? Or how about the Israelites crossing the Red Sea? Or David slinging a rock at the giant? Do you think David looked that much like us? Why am I bringing this up? Just so we can add some melanin to our picture of the Great Commission? No, it's because I want you to see how important it is for us that Jesus said this. That Jesus said not just to make disciples of Galilee, but to make disciples of all nations. The disciples likely would have taken the the simple command to make disciples and would have tried to narrow the focus to figure out just exactly who it was that they were supposed to make disciples of. And it's like Jesus reached into their minds, into their hearts, and plucked out any such restrictions. Make disciples of all nations, Jesus said. I want to paint another picture for you, not on the mountain. Imagine that you're in a big room with no windows. There are some doors along the walls of the room, and in that room with you are a bunch of people. And you walk up to one of the doors and try to open it. 
but it's locked. You try another door. And that one's locked, too. You don't want to stay in that room, and neither do the other people in the room, but the people on the other side of all those doors have locked you up. So much of human history and the ways the world works, even in our modern age, are like that room with all the locked doors. People are constantly making divisions and trying to have some sort of benefit or privilege or nice, shiny blessing. And since there isn't an infinite amount of anything, people close the doors to whatever good thing they found, locking the door behind them. If you're a child, it can be with a toy or with the amount of time you get to play the video game. If you're a teenager, it can be a need to be accepted and loved by a friend group. And you totally forget to think of if there's someone else who needs you to be their friend. If you're working your way up in a company, it can be the notoriety you get for being so clever or so hardworking. And you don't even realize you're trampling on other people on the way up. In a neighborhood, it can be the way you ignore people of certain households on your block. Because it's just going to be too difficult to be friendly with them when they're the ones who probably need your kindness the most. At the family reunion, it can be the cousin who's still making what you see as some rotten choices with their life. And so you pretend to care, but you're actually pretty cold to them, at least compared to how you treat your other relatives. In a church, it can be the opinion that we must just keep the status quo for the survival of the congregation Instead of thinking about the people on the fringes, or those who haven't tried us out, the people that Jesus would have been the very first to walk away from us to go be with. In a church that is even active and aiming at the mission, it can be some way we make there be levels of membership, like those who go to Bible study and those who don't, or those who have contributed so much compared to those who have a different way to help and they just haven't had a chance to do it yet. In a household, it can be the way you always make the conversation to be about your problems or your worries or your pet peeves. There are lots of doors that we try to get onto the other side of and when we do, we make sure to leave the door closed and maybe even locked behind us, don't we? When I was in middle school going into high school and I wasn't going to church, wasn't thinking about Jesus, a friend of mine named Luke invited me to his church's youth group. So I went and I had a good time. But Luke made sure that I kept coming, that I had a ride there that I'd feel included when I was there. Luke was doing a lot to help me out, to hold that door open for me. And I think it's sad that it took me a lot of years after that time to realize that I hadn't been doing that for others. Who could I have been Luke for? I like to have that kind of attitude and effort now, but it wasn't something I was thinking of then. And even now, there are other ways in which I can fall into a habit of not thinking about such and such a person or such and such a group. Because that kind of divisiveness, it's a lazy divisiveness, but it's still divisiveness. It lingers in me. And it lingers in you, too. And it lingers in the church, in every church. Instead of giving you one quick little verse of the Bible to lift our spirits, instead, I want to share with you the entire Bible. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to point out the story of the Bible. You see, the first people, and then all people, including us, have chosen our own way, the path in life that is good for us. Not what God knows is good, but what we think is good. 
And so we create a sort of barrier, a sense of division, right? like a wall between us and God. And while that might seem abstract, might not feel like it has to do with your daily life, the Bible shows us that this division that we made with God has affected all the other aspects of life. The broken relationships and selfish pursuits and lazy, thoughtless divisiveness that we have with other people is a symptom of the disease that is our divisiveness with God. And here's the kicker. We're still stuck in that first room. It's like when we get to another side of the door to some blessing, we find that that next room is just like the first. And the whole structure, the whole building, isn't made up of doors. But really, it's made up of walls. So when Jesus went to the cross and he yelled out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That's one of the things we know he said on the cross. When he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know what was happening? Jesus had put himself right in that first room, right in that first room with us, locked off from any good thing. With all the locked doors that were keeping Jesus from any good thing, being doors that he had not locked with any selfishness of his own, but that we had locked. But the best part is that Jesus didn't only go to be with us in that room, but by dying that death of promise and by rising again to new life, when his heavenly father called him to rise again, do you know what Jesus was doing? Jesus was walking right up to one of the walls of the room, checking the wall to see just how sturdy it was. And then Jesus knocked it right over. Jesus just busted through the wall. I want you to feel that in this picture I'm showing to you. We're going to do a one, two, three, go. And right when I say go, I want you to stomp your feet. Ready? One, two, three, go. You feel the power of that? That's the wall being knocked down. It's a real power. The power of real love that Jesus put into action. Jesus took a perfectly sturdy wall and he knocked it right over. Why? To make a new way. A way for us to get out. To show the silliness of trying to go through any of those lockable doors. Jesus was giving us a new life to live. A life of trusting in him. Of living in his grace, in his mercy, in his protection, in his power, in his compassion, in his thoughtfulness. Not to get us to another room, but to get us out. Into the fresh air of being in his family. And so, you know what's the silliest thing? To keep your door closed. To ever peer through the curtain of the window and decide based on who you see out there that maybe you're not going to open the door for them. To divide. It's silly. And I'm not saying you can't have boundaries in your life. You need your boundaries. You need to give real care to the people you love by dedicating quantity time to your family, not just giving away all of your time to just anyone. And you need to put boundaries around your heart so you don't rely on, on anyone or on someone who has hurt you for their love and approval. Boundaries are good and wise, but the door can't stay shut. I'm not saying to just be kind to people every once in a while. I'm saying to think about who it is, what individual or what group of people it is that you haven't been thinking about. Think of the unthought of. And now it's time for you, you who, who have 
walked through that busted down wall that Jesus blasted open, it's time for you to stop assuming that people are going to walk into the love of Jesus on their own without you bringing them to and through your door. Jesus didn't only love thoughtful women. Jesus also loved thoughtless me. And even that wasn't a division for Jesus. Both Luke and I could be loved by Jesus then and forever. No matter if we had different skin tones or different styles of music we liked or different ways to show love to, in the family or different political views or different amount of cuss words in our vocabulary or different levels of politeness or the difference of one of us being thoughtful and the other not. Jesus has called his people to make disciples of all nations. And it's all nations, all people, that Jesus went to the cross and rose again for, knocking down the wall of hostility between us and God and between us and us. Make it core to who you are. Make it your mission. Not only to make disciples and show love, but to show love and make disciples of all nations. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is for your cause that we go with joy to reap, with faith to sow, as many see you with no wall blocking the way, and many put their trust in you. It is in your powerful and life-changing name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Perhaps you have been able to sing before a creed, like the Apostles' Creed being set to music. Here is a rendition of the Apostles' Creed that was originally done by the Gettys. And I love this rendition. Perhaps you've sung a different version of the creed set to song, but I hope that you enjoy this one because it's as simple and substantive and powerful as the original creed. Resurrected to 
everlasting life to worship love and wonder before the throne of Christ we believe in one true God Father Spirit Son one church one faith one Lord of all his kingdom Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's sing our final song for the service. Deny my 
myself Take up my cross and follow the sun Christ we proclaim The name above every name For all creation, every nation God's salvation Thank you for joining us in this opportunity to sing praises to Jesus and to be built up by him and by his word. The Lord be with you.